This is the ACC on ESPN. A spectacular afternoon in Louisville, which is hosting the ACC championship. And the championship game is today. Valerie Cagle, one of the National Player of the Year finalists, leading Clemson in the circle and in the batter's box, taking on a Duke team that came from behind to beat six-time defending champion Florida State in the semi. So yes, Duke and Clemson about to battle it out. They split their four games during the regular season. Let's go back to yesterday's semifinal. And for Clemson, it was all Cagle for the second straight game. She was in the circle, and this is a home run off pitcher of the year in the league, Keely Rochard. That's all the offense they needed, had another run. Cagle in the circle had seven strikeouts, back-to-back -back shutouts for the ACC's freshman and player of the year. Now, Duke, Florida State, this game was very quirky. Duke down one going into the seventh, but then Jacobson got things started, and Giselle Tapia, Tapia, excuse me, gets a run home to tie it. And then finally, Cameron Jackson off Catherine Sandercock, who had been brilliant in the quarterfinal. That's the game-winning sack fly. The Blue Devils win it for the first time since 2012. Florida State is not in the championship game. It's going to be Clemson and Duke as they get ready to play for a title. Two very unlikely teams, certainly. Clemson, though, did win the regular season. Pam Ward, along with former University of Arizona and National Player of the Year, Jenny Dalton-Hill. So no Florida State this year. We get Clemson and Duke. Between them, they have played a grand total of six seasons of softball. Florida State has been in this championship game the last eight seasons. We get the two new kids on the block coming into this one, but Valerie Cagle has been the story of this one. You've already mentioned it. She was the play she was the freshman of the year and also the player of the year in the ACC. That's the first time that's ever been done in the history of this sport. So we'll see her in the circle. She gets the start. She's a power pitcher and can touch the low 70s with her fastball that runs down in the zone, then creates some vertical separation with an off-speed rise and then throws her changeup at three different speeds. She is extremely difficult to figure out as a hitter. That timing change makes her very successful. And we are underway. Deja Davis, the leadoff hitter for Duke, playing in the DP role for the third time. Actually only had a couple of at-bats yesterday in the semifinal and then was pinch hit four. And which Giselle Tapia has really been big for them, a very good third baseman. And he hits yesterday in the upset over Florida State. Kegel is behind 2 and 0 oh to Davis. And Kegel has had a couple actually of of rough starts, particularly in the semifinal yesterday against Virginia Tech. An infield single and a walk, and she was able to get out of that jam and strand the two runners in the first inning. And then after, she, after that, she seemed to settle in and went the entire way. Well, and you mentioned that walk, just very uncharacteristic of Cagle in the circle. Remember, she's just a freshman. She did play that abbreviated 2020 season, but coming into this one on her 190 and two thirds innings that she's pitched this year, just given up 46 walks. So you don't expect a lot of free passes from Cagle in the circle. Quickly evens it up at two and two, and then gets Davis. Great start today for Cagle. And it is that change of speed that makes her so dangerous. While this one is down in the zone, it doesn't necessarily drop off the table. But because of the speed mix, it makes it definitely difficult to catch up to that. You can see Davis way out ahead. Great off-speed pitch by Kegel for the first out of the game. And that brings up Giselle Tapia. who is two for seven so far in this championship. Duke is a team just hitting 208 in the two games against Louisville and then Florida State. But Clemson hitting only 182. 
Yeah, you mentioned that number, Pam, of Clemson's batting average. They're just 8 for 44 in this one. But the thing that's been impressive is they played pretty error-free. Just one error in the tournament. That's allowed them to be more successful defensively for these low-scoring games. And then when you have Valerie Cagle in the circle, that doesn't hurt either. Tapia picked up at short by Gilstrap. Two away. And there's that solid defense that's definitely going to come into play in this one, knowing that both of these teams don't have a ton of power. You mentioned Duke's 182 average, will, or Clemson's 182 average. Duke actually just hitting 208 in this series, 10 for 48. So runs will be at a premium in this championship game. Cameron Jackson has two of their 10 hits in this series. Sophomore out of Tampa. Duke is a team that has won 13 straight ball games. Their last loss was at Louisville. Another speed change, so dynamic and such an important part of Cagle's time in the circle. She has thrown every pitch for Clemson here in this championship series. They will ride her arm all the way through the postseason to be successful. John Rittman found a good one when he was able to nab the former Delaware commit, Valerie Cagle. That's right, Cagle, who is from Virginia, originally did commit to go to Delaware. They had a coaching change, came down to a a camp at Clemson, and boy, they pursued her big time. And what a get. Now two and two to Jackson. A much more, oh sorry. Go ahead. A much more impressive start for Kegel in the circle than yesterday. We saw some hiccups early on, but she has definitely dialed in for the beginning of this one. A pressure-filled game for their first time in the championship game at the ACC. Not a bad start at all. A couple of strikeouts for Kegel. Two of them in the first inning. Kegel has come to deal. They're looking for their first runs as they head to the dugout. Welcome back, bottom of the first inning in the ACC Championship game. Valerie Cagle with a couple of strikeouts in the circle at the top of the inning, and we will get to see her bat third. Solo home run in the semifinal yesterday for this uh, Clemson team that has had trouble finding its offense. And there is Cagle in the dugout. Seems to always have sort of an intense look on her face. Mackenzie. Clark getting things started. She was one for six in the first two games of this tournament. And Shelby Walters gets the ball. And she only threw one and a third innings here in this championship series, but she lives in the bottom of the zone. And I like this nod knowing that the Clemson offense is going to look to extend and get extra base hits. So as, she, as Walter stays in the bottom of the zone, she also has a rise ball, but it's more of a waste pitch. So as a hitter facing Walters, just look down, try to grab that ball at the knees. She got the start in the quarterfinal game against Louisville. And as you mentioned, only lasted an inning and a third, gave up three runs. Then Peyton St. George came in to finish out the game. They won it by the final of four to three. St. George got the start yesterday as well. Picked up the win. And now they're going with Walters. They have been a really good one-two combination for the Duke Blue Devils. One-two pitch on the way to Clark.
on there. You see St. George in the bullpen getting warm. And you mentioned how good they are as a one-two punch, Pam. And the reason that is is because St. George goes up in the zone and Walters lives in the bottom of the zone. So it definitely changes a hitter's eye. So back to back, they are tough to adjust to when used in the same game. Mark takes it just inside. Scott Mayer behind the plate. We have four umpires. Usually have three during the regular season. Don Brown at third, Alice Leap over at first, and Liz Hammerschmidt over at second base. Not only do we have four umpires, but in this tournament, they have been using the experimental replay to be able to go back to the cameras to figure out if anything needs to be adjusted. And we have seen it used a few times. Some things have been overturned to each coach. That's a Look at Scott Mayer. Each coach gets two challenges. And then from the sixth inning on, the crew chief can initiate a replay. Look, two head coaches. John Ritten starting this. Marissa Brown starting Duke's program. Off speed, fills up the count. And I think that's the story. Marissa Young starting this program four years ago. John Rittman starting this program last season, but did not get to play that entire year because of the COVID pause. And so this just the very first year Clemson making it to a postseason. And a 3-2 pitch laced into right field. Really good at back, bat for Clark, who saw eight pitches. And when you talk to Coach Rittman about Mackenzie Clark, he says she is the complete leadoff hitter. Battles herself all the way back, takes it to a full count, and then just gets this pitch down and out, lets it get deep in her swing. Great first hit of the game, and now a ton of speed at first base. Clark with 21 stolen bases leads Clemson in that department. Gilstrap. Looking for her first hit of the weekend, and you saw right away Kelly Torres, the catcher, pop up and the shortstop cable head towards second. They're very aware of Clark's speed. Yeah, 21 stolen bases on the year has been thrown out five times, but Torres will be eye on first base. Perfectly placed pitch that time by Walters. Torres getting the signals in from her head coach, Marissa Young, who was a terrific pitcher at Michigan, calls the pitches and told us earlier in the year after the game it gives her a splitting headache. It's a lot of information. Trying to get the bunt down. Well, and when we talked to all of these coaches in the ACC, they mentioned how this year was so much different than years past because they played four game series rather than three. They didn't know how many games they'd be able to get in, knowing that there would be a lot of different hoops to step through because of the protocols that they were playing under. So they scheduled those four game series and they said it, it was a chess match. And by the end, you were just physically and mentally exhausted. And had a doubleheader every weekend. These two teams split their four game series during the regular season. Tigers lost only five games all year. They've won 22 of their last 23 games. Only hiccup was a loss to Syracuse the last weekend of the season. Torres back there trying to sell her pitches for Walters. I mean, that hold and grab is, a, is communication back to the umpire that you think that's a strike. But so far that has not been called. They believe that's in the river back there behind the dish by Scott Mayer. Got her. So we saw that off speed being thrown by Cagle for Clemson. Now Walters says, I will show you mine as well. A beautiful strikeout for the first out of the inning. And here she comes, Valerie Cagle. She along with Cami Pereira, who had two home runs against Georgia Tech, only one on the season coming in. And those three solo home runs. Accounting for three of the only four runs that they have scored. And Clemson is a team that on average scores almost six runs per game. 
but they've been scratching for runs so far in this series, or this championship, I should say. Well, and you talk about runs. Clemson actually leads the ACC when it comes to run production with 279 on the year. It has not been what we expected in terms of run production here in this championship series. Now she's taking off the throw from the knees by Torres. Got her! Kelly Torres just gunned down Clark. I <laughs> love that emotion. But it looks as though this one may go to replay. So when it comes to this, it's a ball on the outside part of the plate. But check out that throw and the grab by Foreman. A second baseman covering on this one. Not only does she get the pick on the ball in the dirt, but lays down a perfect tag. Torres fired up by that one. Great job. And just the sixth time that Clark has been thrown out this year on the steal. I'm really impressed with Christina Foreman this weekend, both at the plate and at second base. And as you surmised, yes, John Rittman is going to have the umpires take a look at this. And you take a look at the, the video review that is being used experimentally, both in this, the SEC, and the Sunbelt tournaments. Well, and so far we've seen that a lot of calls have been confirmed, but some very dynamic situations have been altered because they went to the replay and were able to find the right call. And there's a lot of um, issues that umpires fall into. They are always in trouble for the calls that they make, but this replay has actually showed us that they are very consistent in the calls that they are making. But in very critical situations, you're able to be aided by the technology that we've been given. And I'm really hoping that these experimental rules that we're seeing through these three conferences will be able to be extended to the regular season across the board for all of Division I softball. And they confirm it. Well, the call stands. The not confirmed, but the call stands, which means there was not enough video evidence to overturn it. But that was a, a throw from the knees by Torres. And as you mentioned, that's a heck of a tag by Foreman. Oh, and check it out. It's a ball in the dirt. Luckily, it's a long enough hop that it doesn't have to be a pick. But check that out. Right there on the hand before it gets into the bag. Beautiful tag. Foreman, that is an impressive play. Nice job over there at second base. So now two out and nobody on for Cagle. Mallory Cagle hitting 420 on the season. Top 10 finalist for National Player of the Year. The only representative from the ACC on that very elite list. And with nobody on base and two outs, you're okay with this walk. I'm, I'm okay gonna call, with it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I, I call this an, un, an intentional, un, an intentional, unintentional walk. <laughs> and all four of those pitches were off the plate, outside, not, not trying to get in her wheelhouse at all. And that brings up Marissa Gumbardo, who is the DP for the Tigers. One of three Furman graduates who start on this team not graduates, pardon me, transfers, who starred on this team. Well, and Gambarda is the perfect hitter to go behind Kegel. While Kegel is the most dynamic hitter in the lineup, Gambarda has the third highest average on the team and power numbers to back up what Kegel does with 12 home runs of her own. Ooh, that one not called on the inside portion of the plate. Lombarda, first team all ACC, one of nine Tigers who were honored with ACC postseason recognition. Chopper, Cable, gets her to end the inning. Stranding Cable, caught stealing. Good job by Torres and Foreman to help keep things scoreless. Congratulations. This is uh, something special that will be in our trophy case forever. And like I told you when you came to Clemson, you're going to be pioneers and we're going to make history. 
Nobody knew we were gonna make history this quick, but you guys are very deserving of this. So come on up, everybody. Let's get a picture with you. Congratulations. That was earlier in the week before the ACC championship started, and John Rittman, the ACC Coach of the Year, and he did wonderful things at Stanford, took him to a couple of Women's College World Series, USA softball assistant for a decade. And uh, and he was able to build a program, got a nice stadium. But you talk about fast track. This is, this is only their second season and their first complete season because COVID shut them down last year after their first 25 games. Well, and building a program is not new to Coach Rittman. He was an assistant coach at Washington when they built that program from the ground up. He learned lessons about what to do and what not to do. And the thing that was impressive about Clemson is they added the program the right way. They gave him time to step on campus and get his feet underneath him, build a solid foundation, and then supported him financially with what, with that new stadium and also getting athletes on campus before they even needed to compete. Yeah, several of the players came a year or two before they were able to compete. Kegel committed early. She's only 19 years of age, which is kind of terrifying when you think how good she is going to be. So with three more years of eligibility after this one. This is Cable at the plate, the shortstop, who is a senior on this Duke team, but will be returning next year. We have nine graduates, four of whom will be returning. Cable is one of them. Yeah, of those nine seniors that you talked about, one of them that had to be, that is graduating this year is Rain Wilson, who Cable had to come in and help. Rain Wilson was leading the team in offense at the time, and then a season-ending injury takes her off the field. Cable steps in and just does an amazing job. Rain Wilson, a four-time captain. We actually called that game as against North Carolina Central on the ACC Network back in early March, staying on as a student assistant coach. Full count. Cable into center field, then drifting over. Clark makes the catch. So this is the second year for Clemson competing, the fourth year for Duke. And look at those numbers. To be able to step away with that many wins in such a short time goes to show not only are they amazing head coaches, but they have recruited so well because of the schools that they are at, the support that they've been given by their administration, and you see that paying off as they both now enter the uh, very first time that they've had a win in this championship series, but now both in the championship game as well. And that ACC title for Clemson, the regular season title this year. That's why they have the number one seed. Florida State finished second. They did not play each other during the regular season, so if they do play each other, it would have to be in the NCAA tournament. But boy, Duke and Clemson, we were all excited when we heard they were starting softball programs, but I don't think anybody could have imagined they'd be playing at this high of a level, and how about meeting each other in year four and two, respectively, in the championship final. Christina Foreman, the very good second baseman for Duke. Not only does Kegel have great late break on her pitches, but it's that change of speed that just makes her so dynamically hard to pet up, catch up with. You find yourself ahead of everything, and then she goes ahead and takes the ball up to, into the low 70s to blow it by you. Good job to get Foreman, who is always a tough out, already three strikeouts for Kegel. Tomorrow night at 7 Eastern, ESPN Sunday Night Baseball is a series finale between the Cards and the Padres from Petco Park. Coverage starts at 6 Eastern time with baseball tonight. Padres giving the Dodgers a little run for their money in the NL West. Kelly Torres jumps all over the first pitch and lines it over the head of Logalea. And that's a double 
with two outs for Torres. Great job by Torres. That's her second hit in, the se in this championship series. Ball just left up in the zone, down at the knees, but up in her wheelhouse, turns on it, gets right behind this one, gets the barrel out in front. Logaleo reads it incorrectly, takes a step in, has to retreat all the way to the fence. It could have been a stand-up double, but Torres getting herself dirty and putting herself in scoring position. That was the first pitch that Duke has swung at in their now six at-bats. Seven for as Crabtree comes up. And Duke is a team that leads the ACC in doubles. They are going into the tournament 13th in the nation in that category. And just their seven, that's their 77th double on the year. And like you said, Pam, it leads the ACC. Extra base hits are what they're known for. Check it out. They lead the ACC in both doubles and triples. And it's actually Deja Davis, the leadoff hitter, that leads the ACC in that category by herself with seven. And that is a new AC, uh, excuse me, Duke single season record, the seven triples. Cable had six a couple of years ago. Crabtree steps out after falling behind one and two. Crabtree, one of those seniors who also will be coming back next year. She has the most run batted, runs batted in in the history of this program. Coach Young coming over for a chat. Well, and Crabtree has been dynamic in the lineup for Duke in this series. She was one for five, so but that one hit was a double, and right now would be a great time to put together that kind of hitting. But there have been six swings, six swings and misses this inning alone. So Kegel definitely deceptive out of the circle. And the only contact in play was Torres, who took the first pitch in the left field for a double. Did she hold up? Apparently, yes. <laughs> Delayed call. He had to get asked yeah. again. <laughs> Look at that. Just drops off the table. That mm. late hard break comes across at the knees. And so what you have to remember, where the catcher receives it is not where the ball's being called. It's where does it cross through the zone at of the hitter. 2-2. Two -two. Nubbed to first base, Mattimore with the easy final out. Torres stranded at second, still scoreless in the championship game. The ACC Softball Championship is brought to you by Heineken. Enjoy Heineken responsibly. And that is a look at the championship trophy that these two teams are playing for for the first time since 2012. Florida State will not win it for the first time since 2013, excuse me, because 2013 NC State won it and 2012 Georgia Tech won it. And that was the last time Florida State was not in a championship game way before she was born, certainly. <laughs> and if you think about it, six straight titles for Florida State was not contested last year, so you put that seven-year chunk in there that they have been the ACC tournament champions. Neither, you know, that's older than both of these programs put together. They're just six years old. On well, Florida State, the perennial powerhouse, they had to really redefine who they were this year. They've not been able to hit the home runs that we've known them to hit in the past, and as they still navigate those waters, it makes it for a new championship era. Orgaleo thrown out by Tapio on the first pitch of the second inning. And there you see the champions. It's a Florida State, no tournament last year. Georgia Tech beat Virginia Tech back in 2012. Last time Florida State wasn't in it. Lonnie Alameda's team was second in the ACC during the regular season. We expect what, five ACC teams to get into the NCAA tournament. The selection show tomorrow night, 9 Eastern time on ESPN2. We will find out. Both of these two teams will be there for the first time. 
Yeah, the key number when it comes down to the selection committee is RPI. And right now it looks as though five teams in the ACC have RPI numbers that are high enough to be able to garner themselves a spot in the into the postseason, starting with regionals. Right now there are 20 sites that have been named looking to see what those 16 will be. Those will be announced at the same time as the field of participants will be revealed on Sunday night. And Clemson is one of the 20 predetermined regional sites. In their beautiful new ballpark. This is Cami Pereira, who hit one home run all season. That was against Georgia Tech. And then when they played Georgia Tech in the quarterfinals, she hit two of them. And was yeah, their entire offense in that game. You're right, those were the only runs of the game. And the story of Cami Pereira, pretty cool because she was admitted to med school and then chose to defer, was contracted COVID, had to sit out of softball for a little while and then realized, wait, I really do miss softball. So chose to come back and now seeing her play, have so much success in that quarterfinal game against Georgia Tech. Walters with the underhand flip. Out number two. Good start for Ashley Walters. You, we mentioned that she did start that quarterfinal game for Duke and only lasted an inning and a third against Louisville. Gotta feel good to go back out there after being so shaky and, and the confidence that Coach Young and her staff has to not only start her, but start her in the championship game. Grace Matamore, the first baseman for Clemson, is a transfer from West Point. Where she played for a couple of years, led the Patriot League in slugging percentage in her sophomore year. You should mention that Shelby Walters during the regular season got two starts along with St. George in the four-game series against Clemson. It was Walters who pitched really well. She was 1-1, one one, but her ERA was .62. And they gave up one earned run in 11 and a third innings. Well, and her nod here in the championship game is definitely earned. It is not a token appearance, but you will have St. George in your back pocket to give a different look if needed. That's a very nice tool to have waiting in your back pocket Peyton St. George another one of the seniors who will be back both she and Walters were first team all ACC pitchers St. George more of a strikeout pitcher than Walters who is ahead of Mattimore 0-2 And Mattimore was a mid-year transfer, has really been trying to hit with more power this year. But check out this pitch down in the zone. Walters is that drop ball pitcher, but it just starts too low. Recognize that the zone is set by how tall the batter is, not where she crouches down at the end of her either take or swing. Mattimore had a couple of hits in that series against Duke in the regular season. Coach Rittman had to duck out of the way of that liner as it came down the third base line. Clemson hitters have now fouled off 10 pitches. Only in the second inning. Well, and Mattimore has really tried to define herself as a power hitter this year. She only has one home run on the year, but one of the things that Coach Rittman says about her is that by swinging for power, sometimes she can overswing and commit herself a little too early. You're seeing great composure by her, though, here in the box as she takes the count 2-2. Two -two. goes from 0-2 to a full count. Now you would think that jitters would play a part for both sides. Neither 
You know, none of these players have been this far, and certainly in the ACC championships, some of them playing in conference tournaments before they transferred. Eighth pitch of the at bat will be at least a ninth. Well, you'll notice that tape on her fingers. She broke her finger earlier in the year at Georgia Tech and then played through three weeks of pain. So those fingers still a little tender, but she's still able to grip the bat, swing through. Talk about grit. Mm. Another full count pitch on the way. And another foul off. Definitely a quality at bat. And this is this just shows what kind of grit both of these teams have had all year long. They go at each other, but so far, Matamore with five foul balls in this at bat alone. That is a foul ball. Did you ever try to swing a softball bat with broken fingers? Yes, I had a broken thumb oh, at goodness. one point. <laughs> but a thumb is much different than uh, than broken fingers. And check that out. While it does curve on the it's inside close. of the of first base, where it lands is in foul territory, and it, wherever it touches the ground is what deems fair or foul. So. If it was a little bit closer, that's actually one of the reviewable plays that we can see via the replay. There's 14 plays that have been cleared to be able to go back to replay. Yet another full count pitch to Matamore. Swung at a low pitch that might have been out of the zone. Well, and this is just a sign of a good hitter. You want to be in a yes, 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 no mentality when you step into the box, meaning you're going to swing, you're going to swing. You never want to recognize it out of the hand and then make your decision. You want that bat to be ready to go as soon as you see it. And uh, right now, Matamore making contact with a pitch that was probably ball four. Wow. Now that one's going to sting her fingers. That inside of the, of the barrel... Top hand is the one that was affected. That one's going to sting a little. Now Walter's got the first two outs of this inning on six pitches. This is pitch number 13 alone to Matamore. Coming up, eight fouls off of the previous pitches. And that's a base hit. Grace Matamore, heck of an at bat. Props to Matamore, what a quality at bat. Not only is she able to extend that to 13 pitches, but all the foul balls, and then bust it through the five, six hole. Great at bat. Her second hit of the ACC championships, runner on first for Casey Bigham. Number eight hitter. Matamore, not much of a stolen base threat, only one on one attempt all season. Bigham's first season, a grad transfer from Furman. She was a two-time first-team all-SoCon -So player. Perfectly placed. When you talk to Coach Rittman about Casey Bigham, he says she thinks like a coach on the field. Dad was a coach, and uh, she's going to be a big loss for them next year as she heads to work at an accounting firm. She's behind one and two to Walters. Spoils it. Bigham started the year off really hot. 
had a walk-off hit against NC State earlier in the year. One of the things that coach says about her is she just needs to stay within herself. Sometimes she can swing a little bit too big and extend the zone for a pitcher. Left fielder Jackson drifts over to end the inning. Boy, Walters had to throw a lot of pitches for the last couple of batters, still scoreless. There was a lot of drama in the semifinals yesterday. Duke taking on Florida State. Florida State was down in the fifth inning. Sydney Sherrill was able to play to run, and then another one played it by Kaylee Harding. Great fifth inning for Florida State. But in the seventh inning, that's when things got to be a little bit crazy. A hit by Caroline Jacobson, Giselle Tapia, and then Cameron Jackson with the check swing, sack fly. Duke walked it off against the perennial power, Florida State. And that is where we stand. Duke is the number three seed. The top four seeds, as you see, got through to the semifinals, but that Win by Duke, sending Florida State home. And so far scoreless as we go to the top of the third inning. Valerie Cagle in the circle. She and Shelby Walters so far pitching shutouts. Cagle is a name that softball fans are gonna get to know very well over the next few years. She will definitely be a household name. Maybe even this year as they, take, they go to the postseason yeah. and look to make a really deep run. Caroline Jacobson leading things off for the Devils. She's from Tallahassee, playing her college ball up in Durham. She has a hit in this series, and when they played, or I should say during this championship, in four games against Clemson, she had three hits, including Duke's only home run of the weekend. Not a lot, not a lot of home runs being hit in this ACC championship. Throw down, and it's dropped. Contact, though, between Jacobson and the first play, uh, baseman, Mattimore. And we talked about having a, a broken finger earlier on in the season. And the key to this play is it was slow developing as ja as. Jacobson recognized that the ball had been misplayed back behind the dish. She took off out of the box late and ran outside of the runner's lane. And so while the ball did not make contact with her, it did impede the play. But contact made at first base by Jacobson and Matamore. And that's athletic trainer Katie Robtar who is out. That is not the hand in which she broke her fingers earlier. It's the left hand, her glove hand. So check out this play down the line. When it comes to contact at first base, the throw is low. So it's a check swing, third strike, but ball in the dirt, the runner can't advance. As she goes down the line, she is inside the line. The ball trails into the runner. So contact is made. I'm guessing this is a wrist that they're looking at because as she goes to catch the ball, the knee takes the hand, rips off the glove, and there's the reaction. And this for me is exhibit Z for why they need to have an orange bag on the outside that, to, to avoid things like this. Like right. you see everywhere it, else but here. They call it the safety bag and it's an orange double bag. So the orange bag sits in foul territory. That's the responsibility of the runner to touch. And then the white bag would be the ball that, or the bag that sits in fair territory. Matamore would be a big loss for them. So far, it looks like she's going to try to stick it out, but with Rittman on the field, you can only guess that he's talking about how the runner, Caroline Jacobson, was out of the runner's lane on that play.
Mattermore, tough kid, going to stay in there. So the drop third strike results in a base runner. And right now the official scorer is calling that a fielding error by the first baseman, Mattermore. That hurts. That's... I don't in know about that. Here's more Kyle ways Morris. Than one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely a unique turn of events on what should have been just a drop third strike, get the out at one. Now Sarah Goddard is coming in to run for Jacobson over at first base. Goddard is a player who broke her thumb at Clemson, trying to make a catch at the wall and it's working her way back into the lineup. This is the first of four games you're going to see. The other one's on ESPN2 this afternoon. The American Softball Championship coming up at 2 Eastern time, followed by the Big 12. No surprise, it's Oklahoma, Oklahoma State. And then cap it off with the SEC at 6 Eastern. And it's the old, the OG, right? Alabama and Florida. <laughs> yeah, we got that the NG here, definitely the new guard. <laughs> <laughs> with Clemson and Duke. Definitely. Amazing what these the programs in the ACC have been able to do, but then check out uh, what Florida and Alabama have been able to do. And now with the 1-1 count, Frederica Fralick is going to pinch hit for Morris. Don't see that every day. Well, and my guess is after showing Bunt in her first uh, couple of pitches, Freelich a little bit better at the short game. So she steps in with one strike, so already a disadvantage. But perhaps Coach seeing something that they're wanting to exploit out of Clemson. Freelich 0 for 1 so far in this championship. Now the 2-2 lifted towards the Clemson dugout. Well, and what you see Freelich doing is choking up a lot on the bat. And what that does is it gives her a little bit more barrel control. Right now, she's not looking to swing big and drive this one out of the park. She's just trying to make contact and dip it over the heads of these infielders, drive it to the grass, and give an opportunity for our pinch runner over there at first to advance. And instead, the pinch hitter who inherited a 1-1 count strikes out. Tomorrow afternoon, it's the FCC, FCS pardon me, championship football game. Yes, football. Top seed South Dakota State takes on number two seed Sam Houston, 2 Eastern on ABC and the ESPN app. The Jackrabbits took care of Delaware last week. Well, and the unique thing about that championship is that both of those schools looking for their first FCS title while both of these schools looking for their first ACC title. A lot of firsts this year. Championship series, uh, the FCS did not play in the fall, instead pushing it to spring because of the pandemic. South Dakota State's got a really good athletic program in both men's and women's basketball. Boy, it seems every year they get somebody. Somebody in the Power Five is foolish enough to play them and they get gotten. There's <laughs> Deja Davis. Is it Goddard who is trying to come back from that broken thumb with the sliding mitt. Davis struck out swinging her first time against Cagle. Quickly behind 0-2. Davis, a leadoff hitter for Duke for much of the season, was also the starting shortstop for much of the year, but has had some knee issues, was moved out to right field at the beginning of this championship series, and then 
now we see her sitting in that DP role. She also hit first base a little bit screwy in one of her at-bats, and ever since then we've seen her in this DP role. That is the third strikeout of the inning for Cagle. Sixth overall. And if she can get Tapia, it would be a four strikeout inning. Because of the drop third strike. And Tapia had an amazing day yesterday. Check that out. Huge hit out to right. It was misplayed. She was able to head into second base. Great at bat and then went the other way with it. So Jacobson gunned down at second, er, Goddard gunned down at second base on the steal attempt. That gets him out of the inning, but back behind the dish, JoJo Hyatt, great throw. Gets the third out of the inning. Coming up later today on ABC, WNBA Finals rematch. Brianna Stewart and the defending champs take on Asia Wilson and the Aces. Three Eastern time on ABC and the ESPN app. And what an opening day yesterday. Diana Tarazi hit a three to win a game, and so did Sabrina Ionescu, who showed up for their game against Indiana in this Kobe Bryant jersey. They were, they were good friends. And then Sabrina hit a buzzer beater herself. Kobe's going to be inducted into the Hall of Fame in Springfield this afternoon posthumously, and she wore that jersey in honor of Kobe. I'm sure Kobe would be really proud of the way she handled herself in that game where she had 25 points and 11 assists. Well, and Pam, you talked about how Kobe just supported basketball in all of its arenas. You mentioned that he was seeing so many of those WNBA games with his daughter. He's on quite a bit in L.A. and also college games with Gigi. So it's still a, a, just a, a loss that it's hard to wrap your head around it even well over a year later. But ABC with a doubleheader today. Chicago and Washington playing right now. Candace Parker's first game for her hometown team against Elena Deladon, I believe your favorite player, and the Mystics. So JoJo Hyatt leading things off here in the bottom of the third inning. Scoreless game in this ACC championship final. And Walters looking sharp. Yes, yeah, she fills the bottom of the zone and just her second strikeout of the game. Her first was by the changeup and this one just a hard laking drop ball on the outside corner. Great spot for the first out of the inning. Just the third time Clemson has swung in a pitch and not made contact. They had a ton of foul balls in the last inning. To the top of the order, Mackenzie Clark had an eight pitch at bat in the first inning before she singled and then was thrown out trying to steal a base. Then Shelby Walters in the circle for Duke. And we talked to Marissa Young earlier, she said that Shelby came in, she was the third pitcher. She was number three on the depth chart at the start of the season. And Walters took that as a challenge. That she had the I'm gonna show you mentality, went in, fought, and in effect became a co-number one along with St. George. Well, she's just such a great compliment to St. George, where St. George lives with the rise ball for the swing and the miss. Walters comes in with the, not pitch to contact, but pitch to the bottom of the zone, rolls a lot of ground balls. So the defense has to back her up. It was in her outing against Louisville, just uncharacteristic walks. Well, that's a high hop handled by Cable, but then she overthrew it, backed up nicely by Torres to keep Clark at first. That should be an E6. We saw a miscue by Cable yesterday at the end of that Duke-Florida State game, a ball that went between her legs. That is uncharacteristic for, of her. This ball takes a very favorable hop. 
but she just doesn't get that front shoulder down on the release of the throw over to first base. And so right now you've got a runner at first for Clemson. Each team with an error this afternoon. Gilstrap stepping in, and that was indeed an E6. Cable's second error in as many days. But as the ball goes up the middle, it takes a really high hop. And what that can do is take your shoulders up and away where you've been used to getting the ball off the ground. So because she doesn't rein in that front shoulder, this throw sails high. Gilstrap struck out swinging in the first inning. And you could tell, too, that with Clark running so well, and the base is, again, only 60 feet apart in softball, you have to hurry the throw. She might have had a little bit more time to gather herself, but was in, unable to recover after the high hop. Now the one-two with Clark over at first. And a ton of foul balls in this game, Pam. What that shows me is these hitters do not want to leave it up to the umpire for this for the call to strike three back behind them. So very aggressive hitters, but really close to the zone pitches for these pitchers as well. Not a ton of balls left around that have been misthrown. Yeah, we haven't really seen a big mistake pitch yet. That evens it up at two and two. Get dirty. Strap hitless so far. This is the third game because they were in the top four seeds. They all got through to the quarterfinals, so just the third game for each team that we're seeing today. Isn't she the only one with postseason experience? A very brief meeting as Torres went out to chat with Walters. Clark has the most stolen bases on this team. She was caught stealing in the first inning, has not made a move in this at bat. And stayed put after the bobble. And I would expect a more aggressive move over there at first base by Clark, knowing that she's got speed. Anytime a catcher looks to be dropping to her knees, she should be taking that additional step forward. Full count. See if Clark goes now with one out. She does take off with the pitch, lifted into center field. Morris with a good throw back, but Clark did a good job to hustle back. And here comes Cagle. Two outs, runner on first. Let's see the approach to the always dangerous Valerie Cagle. We've seen hitters across the country be respected by putting them on with the intentional walk. Cagle, actually one of those players that was walked with bases loaded earlier <laughs> in the year. They walked in a run rather than giving her the opportunity to score more than one. Just the respect that has been shown to Cagle around the league has been sensational. She walked in the first inning when it, it was obvious they were trying to put her on. And just, just look at the ACC ranks. And remember, this is the starting pitcher who has won 26 games in the circle. I mean, that's just remarkable. Yeah, well, let's I don't think talk they about want any part of her. 
No, I wouldn't either. And you want to keep the ball away from her. You don't want to put the ball in her wheelhouse. The ball that was left inside, high in the zone, that's the one she hit out earlier in the tournament. So with this one, they're going to stay away. So if Kegel wants to hit, she has to make sure she gets her toes on the line and gets ready to go the other way with it. That time she went after the pitch that was well off the plate. And sometimes one of the characteristics you see in a young player is they try to force an outcome. Instead of just taking the walk and passing the bat, sometimes a hitter in this situation can try to do too much. And that's what Kegel should not do. Gambardo backs her up very well. Clemson has great odds with the next hitter as well. When after that, it looked like Cable stumbled coming out of the box as she was thrown out by Cable to end the inning. So Val Cable going after a couple of outside pitches, and she might be a little dinged up. Those pitches on the outside part of the plate, as they get down the barrel, it can kind of mess with your hands. You can see that it, her hand slipped off the bat. You are watching the ACC on ESPN. The ACC championship game scoreless between Duke and Clemson. And let's go back to what happened to Val Cagle on her last swing. She hits the ball off the very end of the bat, but look just above her hands. On contact, the bat breaks. And then hits her in the back of the neck before she advances to first base. That does not happen very often, but so far off the plate, contact made off the very end of the bat, and the bat breaks on that connection. Definitely not <laughs> what Kegel was expecting or anyone here, but so tough to be able to come back out to the circle after that crazy mishap. Oh yeah, that's, that's scary. Not only does that hurt in the hands, but it caught her in the back of the neck as well. So Giselle Tapia, who was in the batter's box when Goddard, the pinch runner, was thrown out stealing to end the third, leads things off in the fourth inning. Pam Ward and Jenny Dalton Hill joining you on another beautiful afternoon in Louisville. Cagle, the freshman and player of the year in the conference, just struck out Tapia. She's got seven Ks. I tell you what, mix of speed is one of the most dangerous tools a hitter can have. And to be able to throw off the plate, drop ball, nip the corner, mix your speeds. I'm Kegel's putting together a performance that garners pitcher of the year as well with an ACC yeah. performance that has now given her the lowest ERA in the ACC ahead of Rochard at Virginia Tech. Yeah, Keely Rochard did get the Pitcher of the Year award. Those two went toe-to-toe -to -toe yesterday. Kegel hit a home run off Rochard and shut out Tech two to nothing. And as you mentioned, skipped past Rochard and now has the lowest earned run average in the league. Cameron Jackson was a strikeout victim back in the first inning. But when you talk about Valerie Kegel, and you can you can put her numbers off up against a lot of people. She is a top ten finalist for National Player of the Year. Easy throw over for out number two as Jackson is retired. Yeah, routine played a short. Gilstrap handles that one easily, and you talk about those national numbers, Pam. The last national player of the year was Rachel Garcia. And the numbers that Kegel's able to put up this season rival what Garcia is able to do in 21. Jamison Cable takes strike one. And the numbers bear it out. Garcia, the veteran, Hampered at just 35 games this year. She had an injury earlier in the season. But 
we show you this because they are both finalists for National Player of the Year who pitch and hit, and the comparison's not bad no. for a 19-year-old freshman. No doubt. Garcia did sit out some of those games early in the year with a little bit of an injury, but Cagle putting herself up there. And the only ACC nod in the top 10 for that Player of the Year finalist. Garcia with the slightly better pitching numbers, especially that gaudy .55 earned run average, but Cagle with the higher average. But they're both scary. Another strikeout. That's eight strikeouts in four innings. Only ten pitches for Cagle. Absolutely, Dean able to confuse these Duke hitters. Comes away with another strikeout. Hey, we have already started off here on ESPN with this terrific scoreless ACC championship. Coming up on ESPN 2 at 2 o'clock, the beginning of a triple header. The American Conference, the Big 12 Conference, and the SEC. Boy, OU and Oklahoma State. Oklahoma State handed OU one of their few losses this year. And then Bama and Florida meeting for the, I think, 4,000th time, <laughs> give or take. Wow, but this year, Bailey Hemphill has really showed up in that SEC tournament with a ton of pivotal home runs to put them in that championship game against Florida. So basically, when you're finished watching this game, turn to ESPN2 and continue to not move. It's good for you. Yeah, order in, just answer the door, <laughs> yep. Yep. pop some popcorn, and uh, sit down for the rest of the day because this is going to be a great one. It's the one. best. And then tomorrow night, selection show, 9 Eastern time on ESPN2. Coach is going to have a little watch party on campus for her team. Both these squads going to go to the big dance for the first time. Scoreless in the bottom of the fourth. Gombardo, or Gombarda, excuse me. Grounded out her first time. Great pitcher stool so far between Shelby Walters in the circle right now. And Valerie Cagle for the Tigers, who has thrown every pitch for Clemson this weekend or in this championship. Well, that's, that's something. That, go, go ahead. That starts the conversation of does yeah. it take more than one pitcher to make a deep run into the postseason? I think that's where you were going. You stole Pamela. my thunder again. <laughs> Sorry. Boom. So it comes down to <laughs> making sure that you have a balanced staff. And I think that Duke has the edge in that situation where they do have back to back pitchers that can go and give different looks. But that doesn't mean I would trade Kegel for anybody. I mean, she's been so dynamic in the circle, able to step in and give you beautiful outings from the pitching rubber but then a step in and back it up with her bat as well now the key to that one is what bat does she use right it broke in her last at bat so <laughs> yes. is that the lucky bat Gambarda starting things off in the fourth with the leadoff single second time they've gotten a leadoff runner on I'm just so impressed with Gumbarda sitting behind Kegel in the lineup. She protects Kegel so well. A pitch left up in the zone, belt high, doesn't try to do too much with it, gets herself on, and Clemson with a leadoff hitter, or a leadoff runner at first. Gumbarda goes out after collecting her hit. And Ariel Oda, who has been playing in right field but not in the batting lineup comes in to pinch run for her and so that is the flex dp line being used at its finest gambarda is the dp the flex player oda plays defense they share the same line offensively so oda has been put in to run for gambarda neither of those players is burned and now here is alia logaleo who Grounded out to third on the very per first pitch she saw in her first at bat. It's a returning freshman from Nashville, second team All ACC, and also on the All Freshman squad. Had three hits against Duke in the four game series during the regular season, but that's hit right to Foreman. Heads up play by the pinch runner Oda to leap on back into first to avoid the double play. 
And that's just a really good read by Oda to recognize that that ball, while low and being fielded by Foreman at second base, did not touch the ground. So she needed to dive back to be safe. Great reaction to be able to pick this one up before it hit the ground. And Oda heads up base running, keeps herself safe at first. Have I mentioned to you that I'm impressed with Christina Foreman's play? This <laughs> how how impressed are you, <laughs> Pam? Because you've only talked about her all weekend long. Well, she's, she's been so it. phenomenal. <laughs> well, actually starting last weekend when she was 8 for 16 against NC State with homeward in five straight games, all four of them against the pack. And she's, she plays a Jenny Dalton-like second base, too. She's nifty out there. Well, thank you. I am impressed because Foreman is one of your favorite players right now. <laughs> okay, maybe I need to amend that. <laughs> no, you were terrific at Arizona. Well, yeah, seriously, Foreman's a good good little player, as I like to say, just a, a junior out of Tampa. So now one away, the pinch runner, flex player Odo at first as the lineup turns to Pereira, and then another throw down. And that's an uncharacteristic situation. I'm gonna say, Pam, you jinxed her on that one, knowing that uh, that's a routine play back up the middle. Ground ball to Walters. The communication has to happen beforehand, though. You recognize that both the second baseman and the shortstop, Foreman and Cable, collapsed on second base. Typically, that is a shortstop that takes that ball, but the communication beforehand was that Foreman would take it. She's got to get up to get that ball. Walters throw a little bit high, and that's one of the hiccups we've seen in Walters' game is the overhand throw. She's overthrown first base throughout the season with the overhand throw, and there the feed a little too high. So that error goes down as a Walters throwing error for the advancement. Yes, that was not Foreman's fault. It was a high throw. Even had she leapt and grabbed it, she would not have been able to put the tag down in time. So Pereira reaching on the fielder's choice. Matamore coming up. She had eight or fouled off eight pitches before she got a single back in the second inning. Clemson has fouled off 22 pitches total in this game. And now a good opportunity, one out, two on, as the bottom of the order comes up. But that was this a masterful not, at bat. Oh, wow, pardon me. This is not Pereira. Oh, this is a pinch hitter. Sorry about that. That's pinch. Keller is pinch hitting for Mattimore, who had that great at bat. I don't get it. I don't get it. But I'm, but I'm not John Rittman. So Keller comes in. Well, and this change actually is probably made because of that situation that happened down first base the injury to the wrist that ah, on that go. play down the line and so taking her out to put in a hitter that may be a little bit more fresh not have the nicks and bruises that Matamore picked up in that last half inning yeah. Keller a returning freshman from Hollywood Alabama Foreman makes the play, two away. Yeah, that's a great point. In, in case you're just joining us, Matamore, first baseman, was run into, and she does have an ice bag on that wrist. So that is why Keller was put in. Matamore stayed in and played first base, but boy, she really, the, the collision was a, was a nasty one. Well, and now you wonder, how does that change the mindset of these Clemson hitters, recognizing that this is their first time ever in this kind of pressure situation? While they are in their second year as a program, last season they ended the year because of that COVID pause early, so this is their first time playing in this kind of pressure. Now Morgan Johnson's going to pinch it for Casey Bigham, who flew out her first time up. 
Morgan has not played yet in the first two games for Clemson in this championship weekend. hitting 342 on the season, 13 of 38, just her 28th game of the year. That does have four home runs. Well, and I like this pitch by Walters, outside corner, recognizing the stature of the batter in the box. She swings a big stick, but she's going to try to keep this one off speed and away. Or go inside. <laughs> And the only other place to go is right underneath the hands of a hitter like Johnson. You do not want to leave this ball big over the plate, even if it's down in the zone. She's going to be able to put a big swing on it. But right now, with runners in scoring position, Clemson has not been successful. 2-1 pitch. Yeah. Torres has to walk that off. Yeah, the foul ball in the foot. One of those, one, one of the places that is not protected. They call them tools of ignorance, but I do not agree with that. Foul ball right off the top of the knee, and that leaves you vulnerable. When you drop that knee to catch a low pitch, we've seen a lot of catchers do that across the board. But when you drop that leg, you leave a ton of thigh showing and leave yourself vulnerable for that foul ball. 2-2 two -two now. Right back, and then the underhand toss by Walters to end the threat and the inning. We are scoreless as we head to the top of the fifth inning. Championship game between Duke and Clemson in the ACC. This is the fifth time these two teams have met. And when they met during the regular season, the Blue Devils took the first two games, and Cagle lost that game. And then on the very same day, the Blue Devils won the second game of the doubleheader. Cagle lost in relief, and then the Tigers took the final two. So they split the four-game series, and in that series, on one day, Valerie Cagle lost exactly half of the games she has lost all season long. She was... Well, one and two during that series, 26 and four. So she's one and two against Duke, 25 and two against the rest of the world. Just crazy numbers to be able to put up. And look at this. Shelby Walters, Valerie Cagle. That's who we see in the circle today. Numbers very similar, but the strikeouts for Cagle, that's the one that stands out. She's done a really good job of mixing her speeds, using all four quadrants of the zone. And to that point, Pam, when it came to that Duke-Clemson series earlier in the year, that both teams had double-digit win streaks that were broken that weekend. Yeah, in fact, it was Clemson that broke Duke's 20-0 start to the season. that included the first two wins in that double header. Clemson has had winning streaks of 17 and 19 games. And that big winning streak, the 19 game streak was ended by Syracuse the next to the last day of the regular season. And then the next day, Clemson squeaked by with a 19 to two win to clinch the <laughs> regular season. Yeah, they're a little, they're a little uh, cranky that they didn't win it the day before. <laughs> well, and that 19-game win streak is the most wins by any women's program at Clemson. What an accomplishment for John Rittman in second full season. Again, Duke just in their fourth season. And here they are meeting in the championship. Christina Foreman leading off. And it hit her. Yeah. 
pitch just rides too far in. It's a rise ball over the inside part of the plate. As a softball player, you do not have to get out of the way, but if you make a move that goes into the ball, that's one of those plays that will bring you back to the batter's box. So as she holds her ground, she takes first base. It's the eighth time that Foreman has been hit by a pitch, one of the team leaders for Duke, and they finally get a they get a base runner for the first time since the third inning. Only one hit. That was Torres's two-out double back in the second inning. Just one hit off of Cagle. And here is Torres at the plate again. Just a heads up, it's Keller at first base. And Keller, who came in to pinch hit for Matamore, who we showed you with the ice on her wrist, is staying in the game to play first base. So, boy, that's just... Uh, just hope Mattimore will be okay when the NCAA tournament rolls on. Both of these teams will get bids, the automatic bid to the winner. John Rittman, no, no stranger to get into the NCAA tournament at Stanford. He took him to 16 straight tournaments in his 18 years. A couple of Women's College World Series. The first one with Jessica Mendoza. The sweet sweet swinging outfielder. She had a nice little lefty swing that was kind of cute to look at. <laughs> more than cute, dangerous is more <laughs> the, the word I would use. Well, and when it comes to John Rittman, he actually went to the World Series before that. He was an assistant coach at Washington and took them to the championship game against the University of Arizona back in 1996. And how did that game work out? with a really sweet swing. <laughs> <laughs> One of your three natties. <laughs> two, two pitch on the way to Torres. Bagel's 63rd pitch of the day. Bounces away from Hyatt. Now Foreman easily into second on the wild pitch. Well, and these miscues are not expected from Cagle. And if they were to happen, I would have expected them perhaps last inning after having the bat break and it hit her in the neck. But she came back so strong in that next inning with two strikeouts. Now a walk and a wild pitch. A hit by pitch and a wild pitch. So two oh, sorry. errant pitches. You're forgiven. But full count now <laughs> on Torres. A runner on second without getting a hit. This Duke team scrappy, man. They came from behind in the seventh inning. They got a couple of runs yesterday to take out six-time defending champ Florida State. That is fielded nicely by Bigham, who throws over to get Torres and hold Foreman at second. Another example of why it's called the hot corner. Squared up and taken down the line. Great pickup and gets to her feet so quickly for the cross the diamond throw. Bigham, a great play for the first out of the inning. Well, that was absolutely terrific for the grad transfer from Berman. So I don't know that that conference was actually done to talk to the umpire, and that little smile maybe gives it away. That conference was made so he could pass something to JoJo Hyatt back there behind the dish. That card that slips in the wristband is the sequence of, not sequence of pitches, but numbered pitches that will be called from the dugout. So the communication that needed to happen was maybe just a little bit off. <laughs> And that would lend itself to that wild pitch. If a pitch was being called that she was not expecting, mm. that's why the ball would have gotten back to the backstop. Crabtree tried to get the bunt down. It's 
So you see the numbers being called by the coach in the dugout, then they look at their wristband, and that's how they communicate what pitches need to be thrown. Duke 0 for 4 with runners on base this afternoon. Clemson 0 for 9. It's all about timely hitting. Still waiting for that in this scoreless championship game. Just a little half swing, easily handled by Pereira for the second out. Coming up tomorrow at 7 Eastern, ESPN Sunday Night Baseball. The Cardinals and the Padres finish up their series at Petco Park. At 6 Eastern time, that's when things start with baseball tonight. Boy, the Padres, an up-and-coming franchise after being sort of, you know, an afterthought for a long time. Well, they're second in the National League West, and then the Cardinals lead National League, Cent National League Central. So it's going to be a good matchup. San Diego's a nice town, by the way. Oh, it's the best. Ooh, respect. All right, Caroline Jacobson with first base open, being put on in a real intentional walk. You don't see this a lot in softball where the catcher pops up like that. And this is part of the game that some coaches say is underutilized to be able to set yourself up defensively for a for a, an out, a force play at every base, especially as you head to the bottom of the lineup. Kyla Morris struck out in her last at bat, but they feel that she's the lesser of two evils, especially in this situation with a runner in scoring position. So Coach Rittman playing the odds, and now here's the counter move by Coach Young. Sydney Bolin played yesterday, was 0 for 2 against Florida State. Her seven game hitting streak came to a close. I really like this move by Duke. This is a great put in for their offense. Bolin, while she didn't get a hit in that game against Florida State, she came in for Deja Davis in the fifth and in the seventh and squared up both of those pitches, took it to left, and then took it hard at the shortstop. So down here at the bottom of the lineup, Kyla Morris was pinch hit for in her last at bat. And so with this removal again, that burns Morris. What will that do to the center field slot? Good strategy. Moves and counter moves between Rittman and Young. With two away and two on in the top of the fifth. Pitch at the knees, called a strike. Bolin, another transfer for this Duke team, started out at Central Connecticut State. She's got a job lined up already, one of the graduates who's going to go right in. Right now her job is to try to solve Kegel, which is, I'm guessing, more difficult than just about any other thing you can try right now. <laughs> Nice spot, that drop ball down and in, so hard to catch up to, especially with that late hard break.
Another 0-2 on the way to Bolin. Kegel strikes her out to strand two more. The ninth strikeout of the game. Huge strikeout on the pinch hitter Bolin. Gets Clemson out of the inning. And we stay scoreless. <laughs> It is coming. The selection show tomorrow night, 9 Eastern time on ESPN2. Then the regional supers. And finally, Oklahoma City, June 3rd to the 9th for the World Series that we all missed so dearly last year. Jenny Dalton Hill will be there, part of the studio presence on site. I am so excited to step foot back in Oklahoma City. And while it may not be in uniform, it's one of my favorite <laughs> places to be this time of year. And you heard Beth Moens at the end of that promo say, um, it's where everybody wants to be. It's definitely true for all of these softball teams as they chase history and these two making it here in the championship game of the ACC. 64 teams make the tournament. 31 automatic qualifiers. One of these two teams will be in AQ as the ACC champ. The other one will get in. And only eight get to go to Oklahoma City. So we go to the bottom of the fifth inning. JoJo Hyatt, the catcher, starting things off. Shelby Walters and Valerie Cagle. What a good old-fashioned pitcher's duel. Both of these teams have been challenged, particularly, not particularly. I mean, Clemson's only scored four runs in their first two games, winning both two to nothing. There's Duke. Beat Louisville four to three, identical score against Florida State. But the unique piece to this matchup here today is that Florida State is not in it for the first time in eight years. 2012, the last time the Seminoles weren't there. And Hyatt caught looking. Later on today, at 3 Eastern time, it's the WNBA Finals rematch on ABC. It's the defending champion Storm taking on the Aces on ABC and the ESPN app. Regular season underway. Last season, the Storm swept the Aces 3-0 in the finals. Asia Wilson, the regular season MVP. Brianna Stewart, finals MVP. It's going to be a good matchup. Yes. Sue Bird playing. It's her 20th season. The ageless wonder. She's got four rings already for the Storm. But right now, Washington playing Chicago. Great endings to the WNBA last night. Diana Taurasi, Sabrina Ionescu with buzzer beater. Buzzer beating threes to win games. Great time of year. Top of the order, Mackenzie Clark, who was singled and reached on an error. Championship Saturday here. Great stuff. Dominique Salinas has taken over in center for Kyla Morris, who was pinch hit for twice, as Jenny mentioned in the last half inning. That burns her eligibility for the game. Foreman. Got it. Second out. And that's another thing I really like about softball. In baseball, if you're if you're subbed out, you're done. But in softball, there's certain strategies where you can re-enter the game. And, and we saw both Coach Young and Rittman use that very well, especially in the last half inning. So it's, it's intriguing, and it gives you more options. Well, only the starters can be re-entered. So if you come right. into the game as a reserve, you are still burned if you come out. But those starters can be re-entered. It's a unique piece of the softball world. Strap. First pitch swinging and she is robbed by Tapia. Lays out to end the inning. First time that 
Clemson's gone down in order. Tapia off the line, an awesome play. The dive, the catch, and they get themselves out of the inning. This is the ACC on ESPN. Championship Saturday, it is a pitcher's duel. We expected certainly Valerie Cagle to be a challenge, but hats off to Shelby Walters. Had a really tough outing in the quarterfinals against Louisville, but both of these pitchers are getting it done. Yeah, Shelby Walters had to be pulled after one and a third innings, gave up two walks, had three earned runs. They had to fight and claw their way back to that win against Louisville that they did get four to three to make it to the semifinals against Florida State. So here we go. Top of the sixth inning scoreless in the ACC championship. Clemson in their second year playing softball, taking on the old guard, Duke. They're four years old. What a, what a story that, that has developed with Florida State going out in the semifinals yesterday. Duke scoring two runs in the top of the seventh to win that game. And it's the top of the order. Deja Davis struck out twice against Cagle this afternoon. I am used to seeing a very dynamic and powerful Deja Davis at the top of the lineup. But so far in the last handful of games five six games she has not been very productive sitting at the top of the lineup yeah you have to wonder just how healthy she is coach young disclosed to us that she has a, a pain a, a knee that's been bothering her not as mobile that's one of the reasons why she moved around a shortstop but yeah this is a this is an athlete who hits well over 400 and just doesn't seem to look like herself unable to play in the outfield where she was playing before this weekend. Had her nine-game hit streak broken against North Carolina. Just a very disciplined hitter. Has made the most offensive gains out of all of the hitters in the Duke lineup, but so far has found herself with just one hit. Well, that hit was a triple. But yeah, this is not what you're used to seeing from a premier leadoff hitter. She leads the team in average, has seven home runs, and she does lead the ACC in triples. She got that other triple in this championship series, so she has seven on the year. But her batting average is fourth in the ACC. Her slugging percentage is seventh. A very good hitter at the top of the lineup. She tripled in the quarterfinal win against Louisville. Hitless yesterday against Florida State and 0 for 2 with a couple of strikeouts so far in this game. First team all ACC this year. Up in the air and it takes a Duke bounce. That ball had eyes. It knew exactly where the line was. While it landed in foul territory, it had enough spin on it, on the slap, to be able to land in foul territory and come back into fair play. That was a favorable bounce. Duke is gonna have to take advantage of this gift that they've been given. Now, there might have been two gifts on that. First, it, she popped it up, which could have been caught if it was just a little bit, hit a little bit harder, and then, that bounce. And then it died. Not only did it make the hard left, it just died. And right there in fair territory, it stopped quickly. Now, Deja Davis is good, don't get me wrong, but that was an unexpected no. favorable play off of the slap. And here's Tapia. Made that spectacular grab of the liner to end the fifth inning out at third base. Davis, when she's healthy, is certainly a threat to steal. There she goes, and she's got it. 
Davis using her wheels to put Duke in scoring position is able to grab her 13th stolen base of the year. Just a great jump, peeks in at the runner to make sure that the ball was not touched. A, just executed perfectly, a throw a little bit off the mark. And goes in feet first, which you don't see a lot anymore. Protecting her hands, and a great jump. Just in softball, you can't go until the, legally you can't go until the ball leaves the pitcher's hands. Sometimes you, you know, get a little millisecond, a little whatever advantage. So top of you trying to get it over to the right side to advance Davis. That's just the second hit of the game for Duke. Torres had a double back in the second. Clemson only has three hits. Full count. And the walk surrendered by Cagle is the first unintentional or the walk. And yesterday, it was Cameron Jackson with the game-winning sacrifice fly. And here she is up again. It's like you knew what was happening, Pam. You knew that walk was about to happen. Great eye by Tapia to Pressing be able it. to show plate discipline. Advantage Duke, no outs, a runner in scoring position. Same situation as in the fifth inning, but will they be able to capitalize and get a run this time through? Keller, the first baseman, who replaced Mattimore, who left the game after hurting her wrist in a play in the field. Playing in, Duke 0 for 4 with runners in scoring position. There's Keller. That gets away from the catcher. Another wild pitch from Cagle advances the runners. Ball in the dirt. Hard push off drop ball that just gets away from Hyatt back behind the dish. A 60 foot advantage now. An advancement, Duke just 60 feet away from their first run. First time Duke has had a runner on third base this afternoon. They've stranded a couple at second. And that's the second wild pitch for Cagle. Visit Coach Young coming out to make a move. Scott Mayer, the home plate umpire. And it's a pinch runner. Kendall Lange, who we have seen throughout the season as a pinch runner for the Blue Devils, running for Tapia.
on this situation is when you have to dig down deep. Defenses cannot get tight in this situation. Even if a run is looking to score, the defense is going to be pulled in a little bit to try to keep the runner at third. But this is a time where you see the kind of grit you're made of. And Clemson has Millie Thompson throwing in the bullpen. Cagle has thrown every pitch in this championship. Thompson, an ACC all-freshman performer. Second most innings behind Cagle. Two, two. And while Thompson is warming, I do not see Kago coming out of the circle willingly. Even if Rittman comes out there, I see her challenging him and telling him to leave her in the circle. Two on, nobody out in a scoreless game. Little dribbler. That's going to get a run home. It didn't travel far, but it was far enough to get Davis in for the first run of the game. It doesn't take lasers to score runs, and this is perfect proof of it. Hit off of the end of the bat, squibbles its way out to the shortstop. There's no time to get the play at the plate, and great base running moves the pinch runner Lange over to third Duke on the board with the first run of this game here in the championship another RBI for Jackson on that ground out this Cable almost threw a bat out trying to get to get a bun on that pitch Sydney Bolin is on extra duty trying to, is she trying to be hype girl of the team? What's going on? I mean, high fives down the line. Sydney Bolin has entered this game. Ended the end of the last inning, but she's firing everybody up. And for those of you tuning in to see the American Track League, it is now being shown on ESPN News. That's coming up after this ACC championship softball game is over. It is Duke leading Clemson 1-0 in the top of the sixth inning on an RBI ground out by Cameron Jackson. First run of the game for either team, and that's off Valerie Cagle, who's both the player of the year and the freshman of the year in the ACC. Pam Ward and Jenny Dalton-Hill joining you on a spectacular day for softball in Louisville. Cable with nine strikeouts, but an infield single, a walk, a wild pitch, and then the RBI ground out. Duke able to score. And that run is the first that Cable has given up in this ACC championship. Gets Cable for the 10th strikeout. Back-to-back 2-0 complete game shutouts for Cagle earlier in this championship. And then she gives up a run without the ball leaving the infield. And she just threw her 100th pitch. Christina Foreman hit by a pitch her last time up. And Pam, we've talked about run production for Clemson and how it has been at a premium. They've only scored four runs in this championship series, three of them by the home run. And so it's going to take some manufacturing, just like Duke has done, to be able to combat what they've done in this inning with a ball not leaving the infield but able to put a run up on the board. Clemson with three hits today, only 11 hits as a team so far. Foreman goes down. Back-to-back -back strikeouts to end the inning, but Cameron Jackson 
with the RBI ground out. Cagle's going to lead off in the bottom of the six, trailing by one. Things off, and in her last at bat, Duke tried to stay away from her. Off the plate in all four pitches, but check out what happens in this one. She hits it off the end of the bat, and the bat actually breaks in her hands. And as it breaks, it pivots around and hits her in the back of the neck. She was able to come back out into the circle and get the next three batters out. One, two, three. Will she be able to come against Duke Shelby Walters? But St. George, so as I say that, St. George will enter the game for <laughs> Shelby Walters. My apologies as we sit at home and try to call this game remotely. Shelby Walters relieved for Peyton St. George in the circle for Duke. A power pitcher will be up in the zone. That's a different look. A different look, and we'll see how they approach pitching to Cagle because Walters, as you said, every pitch was away. The pitches that Cagle swung at were not in the strike zone. They put her on with a, a walk the first time she came up. Not an intentional walk, but nothing near the plate. And then Cagle, not showing a lot of patience that second time around, wanted to get her hacks in. And down 2-0. And she swings in another one in that same location where Walters got her. Well, in this situation, you know that you've only got six outs to play with. Three in the sixth, three in the seventh. And what can happen with youth sometimes, you try to force an outcome. So as Cagle gets in the box, she's got to just be patient. But she's take, not. No, take the walk if they're going to give you the walk. Now with two strikes, she's going to have to get herself back in this one. But they are not pitching to her. These balls are in the opposite batter's box, and she continues to swing and miss through those pitches that are going to be hard to reach. So in effect, getting herself out, because think about it, she would be the leadoff runner on in the sixth inning. Trying to force the issue. I remember she's only a, she's a freshman. She's a returning freshman, was on the, squad last year when they had to shut things down, but he's trying to force it a little bit too much. Yeah, she hit 376 in that abbreviated season with 10 home runs. This year leads the team in average and home runs as well. So she is one of those hitters that is scary, and Duke has tried to stay away from her. St. George gets her. And Pam, what this comes down to is just plate discipline, trying to force an outcome late in the game. They put her on. If she does not take the bat off of her shoulder in this at bat, she would have been at first base. But because of that forcing of the issue, she now sits down as the first out of the inning. Barda singled her last time up. St. George won the quarterfinal game against Louisville coming in after an inning, an inning and a third when Walters was struggling. On well, St. George, when she steps in the circle, not only does she throw up in the zone and is a power pitcher in the upper 60s, but she's got a unique changeup that is so good and reliable. More of a strikeout pitcher than Walters. And she's got back-to-back -back K's to start the sixth. Peyton St. George just filling outside of the zone. And Clemson continues to swing at these pitches that are not strikes. But she is a different look than Walters, who has been down in the zone for most of the day. And as she elevates these hitters' eyes, they are swinging and missing at pitches off the plate. Two out, nobody on. Rogaleo, who was 0 for 2 against Walters. It's 
St. George with a complete game win yesterday that come from behind victory against Florida State that put Duke into this championship game. Trying to strike out the side. And I think what we sometimes fail to remember is that both of these teams are very young. Clemson especially, tons of new faces because this is a, just a second year program. So you're seeing freshmen in the lineup and what is the first time they face this kind of pressure. St. George gets the another strikeout, able to strike out the side, send Duke back to the dugout, protects the one run lead. Clemson, what are they going to do with the three outs they have left? St. George has something to say about it. She's going to sit him down quick. It's been a wild one here in Louisville. Only one run scored, and it started in the top of the sixth inning. A random single and a stolen base put Duke in scoring position. They walked the next batter to put runners on first and second. An advancement on the wild pitch moved Duke to over to third base, and then a soft roller over to the shortstop allowed Duke to squeak in the only run of the game. Fired up, and with the lead, they're here in the seventh. Yeah, the speed of Deja Davis, that infield single, stolen base, advanced on a wild pitch, as you said, and then scored on a ground out. Duke Dutton did not get the ball out of the infield, and they have scored the only run of this game, heading to the top of the seventh in the ACC championship game. Kelly Torres has one of only two hits against Cagle, a double back in the second. That run that was scored in the last inning, the first allowed by Cagle, who's thrown every pitch for the Tigers in this championship, back-to-back, 2-0 -back, scores and complete game shutout wins. But the Tiger offense, as good as Cagle has been, the Tiger offense has been very, very quiet this weekend. Well, and in this game, Pam, we only have five hits, and that run was scored as a ball did not leave the infield. Everything was on the dirt. We're not seeing a ton of power, and that's to be expected against the pitchers that you have here in the championship game. Two-two on the way to Torres. A dozen strikeouts now for Cagle, three in a row. Tomorrow afternoon, the F. CS championship football game from Frisco, Texas. It's number one seed South Dakota, number two seed Sam Houston. Catch it 2 Eastern on ABC and the ESPN app. South Dakota State Jackrabbits. Yeah, their first title game appearance. So are they going to be able to come against uh, Sam Houston, who is 0-2 in the finals? Going to be a good one. Claire Davidson coming in to pinch hit for Rachel Crabtree, who is 0 for 2 today. Davidson puts it in play. Pereira flips over for the second out. Oh. 
Caroline Jacobson, the left fielder, has been on base twice today. Reached on an error and then was intentionally walked back in the fifth inning. JoJo Hyatt comes out to speak with her ace pitcher. Valerie Cagle, 26 and 4 on the season. Two of those losses coming to Duke in a doubleheader during the regular season. One start, one relief appearance. Cagle has 25 complete games out of her 28 starts and 11 shutouts. She's 19 well, years old. The, off <laughs> the offensive output <laughs> against her shows you why she's so good. She just mixes speeds, fills the bottom of the zone, uses all four quadrants, and Duke has not squared her up, but they've taken advantage of the opportunities presented. Hickel with two walks today, one of them intentional to go along with a dozen strikeouts. 246 strikeouts, 46 walks. She's plus 200 now in that category for the season. It's just remarkable. But right now, she's on the hook for the loss, unless her team can rally in the bottom of the seventh inning. And they will have to do that with the bottom part of their order. Six, seven, eight, due up. Cami Pereira and the seven and eight hitters were both pinch hit for the last time through the lineup. Strikeout number 13 for Cagle. Clemson's final chance coming up in the championship game. So the one-two punch of Shelby Walters and Peyton St. George shutting down Clemson this afternoon. Shelby Walters, masterful in the bottom of the zone, was able to get Cagle on that down and out pitch. It was, it's just St. George and Walters, such a dynamic duo for them in the circle. St. George came in, struck out the side in the sixth, and now will face seven, eight, nine in Clemson's last effort to try to even, and even this up. And Clemson winning their first two games against to get here against Georgia Tech and Virginia Tech. Two nothing identical scores, shutouts thrown by Cagle. But as you saw in that graphic, they are for this championship 11 for 66. That is a team batting average of 167. Coming into this game, they were hitting over 300 as a team for the season. Pereira leading things off. 2 solo home runs in the 2-0 win over Georgia Tech in the quarterfinals. Has not gotten a hit since. St. George right now just overpowering these hitters. Struck out in order, order. Cagle, Gambarda, and Logaleo, the heart of their lineup in the sixth inning. Well, what makes St. George so good in the circle is the first six inning, or the first five innings for Walters, who lived in the bottom of the zone. So now as St. George enters, she elevates these hitters' eye. And as they head, they look to engage with a pitch. They're making a decision on a ball that continues to move up and out of the zone. At least contact this time. Foreman went away. <laughs> 
Clemson in its second season playing softball. Duke in season number four. St. George, a veteran in the circle. Got the ball whenever Duke would play ranked teams. First ranked win for this program was last year when they won at Texas. And it was St. George who got the ball. And here she has the ball trying to close out an ACC title. Keller came in for Mattimore who hurt her wrist, a collision at first base when she was playing defense. Great pitch inside in the river. As a hitter, if you swing at that, it's going to be a foul ball. Hard to keep that one fair, so it's a great pitcher's pitch. Jacobson, two away. Who could been to the two ACC championships played since they came into existence? They didn't win a single game. They got shut out in one game and then lost to Notre Dame 9-2 to two, two years ago. Two one-run wins to get here. Identical 4-3 to three scores over Louisville and then Florida State with the two runs in the seventh inning to come from behind and win yesterday in the semis. And here they are, one out away from a championship over the regular season champion team. Roll one to Bingham. And that is just foul. So Duke came into this championship the number three seed Clemson came in as the number one foul ball ripped hard down the line that's what that down and in pitch is going to be consistent foul ball but this is going to be not only their first championship but Duke ranked 21 Clemson ranked 10 this is a huge win for this program 0-2 Bigham continues to protect Cable throws over, and Duke has done it in only their fourth year as a program. The Blue Devils are the ACC champions. A team that doesn't give up scored the only run in this game on hits that didn't make it out of the infield. The future is bright for Clemson in just their second season as a team. But Duke victorious here in the ACC championship. Not only was it their, is it their first championship, it was their first wins in the postseason. So congratulations to Duke. They'll take home some hardware. And they get the automatic bid out of the ACC. Valerie Cagle loses for only the fifth time this year. Three of the five losses have come to Duke. Here's Cable, shut the door. Aggressive move forward, doesn't let the ball take advantage of her, seals the deal. Check out how excited Torres is from back behind the dish. Man, that's such a great feeling. And the momentum that they're able to carry now into their first ever postseason run. And remember, they were three outs away of being eliminated yesterday. Came up with the two big runs in the seventh inning to 
eliminate Florida State just to get here, score the run without getting the ball out of the infield in the sixth inning. We'll see the Tigers in the NCAA tournament for sure. But just a terrific performance at Shelby Walters. Very emotional. Number eight there on the left of your screen. It was the starting pitcher. So congratulations to the Duke Blue Devils, the ACC champions. I want to thank everyone, our great crew for the entire week. Jenny Dalton Hill. I'm Pam Ward. As the we have track coming up. Cagle will see more of her in the NCAA tournament. Duke wins it. Their third one run win of the championship. So long from Louisville.